Welcome to uh, Penn Humanities Forum. I'm Jim English. I direct the forum. Um, come on down to the front if people are just coming in. Um, you probably know tonight's lecture is the first in a pair of talks by Dorothy Roberts on black women's sexuality. It's really it's a, it's a, a key moment, a high point in the uh, year-long series on sex. And I really encourage you to attend both of these events next Wednesday. Uh, we'll again be at 5 p.m., but not in this room. It will be over in Claudia Cohen Hall on, uh, off of uh, Spruce Street <clears throat> um, in the lower level, G17. You find all the information on the website, but just uh, make a mental note that you won't be coming here uh, next Wednesday to, uh, to hear uh, Dorothy's talk. These lectures are presented through uh, a partnership with, uh, with, um, be between the forum, and we're the hosts tonight, and the Alice Paul Center for Research on Gender, Sex, and Women, who will be hosting the event next week. So I want to express my gratitude to Nancy Hirschman, who is the director of the Alice Paul Center, for all her efforts in putting this together. Um, also, our own Jennifer Conway and Sarah Varney and Michelle Moon um, deserve much credit, too. Thanks most of all to our topic director for this year's program on sex, Heather Love, She's put tremendous energy and goodwill and inspired creativity into the enterprise. Heather's the R. Jean Brownlee term professor in the English department and a major force in gender and sexuality studies throughout the, uh, the academic world. Just to give you a sense of the range of amazing scholarship that Heather does, her most recent publications include essays on pornography, on the politics of racist microaggression, on the readerships of Thomas Mann and William Shakespeare, and on debates over methods of reading and description in sociology and in literary studies. For the Penn Humanities Forum, which takes a broad interdisciplinary view of the humanities, Heather's the ideal topic director. Please give her a hand. She will introduce Dorothy Roberts. Thank you so much, Jim. You really sweetened the pot of doing the, coming to these lectures, because you always say such nice things about me. Um, I just want to reiterate what Jim said about um, this being an incredible high point in the series. I'm so pleased to welcome Dorothy Roberts to this year's series on sex. Uh, please come on in. There's plenty of room. Have a seat uh, up closer to the front. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Professor Roberts is the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Moselle uh, Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at Penn. Uh, she came to Penn in 2012 and founded the Program on Race, Science, and Society at the Center for Africana Studies, um, which is an interdisciplinary center that explores the role of race in scientific research and biotechnological innovation and examines the historical, scientific, and social roots of health disparities. Though she arrived relatively recently, Professor Roberts has already had a transformative effect university-wide at Penn. This isn't surprising. She's had a national and international impact on fields including law and public policy, health, social justice, and bioethics. Professor Roberts' work confronts the epistemological and social determinants, as well as the everyday impacts of structural inequalities, focusing in particular on the situation of women, children, and African Americans. She's the author of many books, including the co-authored Sex, Power, and Taboo, which examines the influence of gender on sexuality and sexual behavior, uh, in particular its impact on HIV risk and prevention in the Caribbean and beyond. She's also the author of Fatal in Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, which examines how the myth of, biologic of the biological concept of race continues to promote inequality and undermine social justice. Her book, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, received the Outstanding Achievement of Cultural Competency in Child Maltreatment, Prevention, and Intervention Award, and the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African American Communities Research Award. Her book, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, which crucially reframed debates over reproductive rights from a black feminist perspective, received the Myers Center Award from the Study of Human Rights in North America. Professor Roberts' scholarship and her contributions have been widely recognized, and I can only really begin to skim the surface in terms of her awards and accolades. She's held fellowships at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University, the Hastings Center, and Stanford University Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and she sits on the board of directors 
of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. She received numerous awards for her work in public policy, for her leadership in mentoring, for workplace and community, community advocacy, and for her contributions to local and global human rights initiatives. She is also the recipient of the Solomon Carter Fuller Award from the American Psychiatric Association for providing significant benefit to the quality of life for black people. So even with just a small sampling, I think you can see the incredible range and impact of her work. We count ourselves very fortunate to have Professor Roberts as a colleague and intellectual leader at Penn. And tonight, you guys are very lucky to have her speak to the topic, what's so dangerous about black women's sexuality. Please welcome Dorothy Roberts. Thanks, Heather. You sweeten it too. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the Penn Humanities Forum and the Alice Paul Center for Research on Gender, Sexuality, and Women, Jim, Nancy as well, and everybody involved in putting this together. Um, I'm just really honored to have been asked to speak in this great series on sex, and especially that uh, the Humanities Center and the Center for Research on Gender, Sexuality, and Women, Hermanis Forum, uh, came together to coordinate two lectures so I could really have a chance to speak on this topic and uh, explore in more depth than I'd usually have, except maybe in a class, <laughs> to um, look at both why black women's sexuality is considered so dangerous, but also how we might take those insights to liberate sexuality for everybody. That would be hard to do in one lecture. <laughs> it's a challenge to do this in one lecture. Okay, so what's so dangerous about black women's sexuality? Well, you all know what I have to start with. Of course, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> Like, how could I give this lecture and not mention Beyonce's uh, uh, Super Bowl performance? So, as the whole world knows, 100 million people around the world know, uh, Beyonce surprised the audience uh, at the halftime show by performing her newly released video formation live, backed up by an entourage of black women sporting uh, clearly, for those who know the history, uh, Black Panther Party Afros and Berets. Uh, and she also made it clear in the lyrics of her video that she was saluting the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, protesting against police brutality, and also celebrating black culture and black beauty uh, including her, quote, Negro nose with Jackson 5 nostrils and her daughter, Blue Ivy's baby hair and afro. And by and large, at least from what I can tell from black Twitter, black people cheered her message. You know, there's a, there's a little debate about how radical it really can be as part of a Super Bowl performance, but I think most black people were really proud and happy that Beyonce was as militant as she was. Now, white America, on the other hand, <laughs> reacted, at least much of it reacted quite differently, swiftly condemning uh, Beyonce for her anti-police performance. Republican Representative Pete King of New York released a long statement the very next morning criticizing Beyonce for attacking the police. Uh, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani appeared on Fox News and he had the same message and then he reminded the audience that the Super Bowl is intended to entertain middle America. <laughs> so, quote, let's have decent, wholesome entertainment. Eventbrite posted a notice for an anti-Beyonce protest rally at NFL headquarters to denounce her rape baiting stunt. I don't think it took place, it was supposed to take place yesterday, I think. Did it happen? I don't think so. No, okay. <laughs> no one showed up, okay. But we were called to, at least white people were called to denounce uh, Beyonce. 
So Beyonce's popularity is astronomical, and it has cut across racial lines. Forbes magazine, in fact, named her the most powerful female musician of 2015. So why did her performance this time seem so dangerous to white people? Saturday Night Live gave one answer. Have you seen it? <laughs> A comedy skit called The Day Beyonce Turned Black. <laughs> And the skit shows white people realizing for the first time because of the way, you know, her entourage at uh, the Super Bowl that she is black. Uh, and what scared them, you know, the, I mean, the whole skit shows them just totally terrified out of their wits that Beyonce is black. And what scares them the most is that little white girls have been consuming and dancing to her dangerous message uh, and blackness all this time without their parents <laughs> realizing, you know, what was going on, how they were being brainwashed, placing them at risk of becoming black themselves. And there's one scene where a white mother opens a bedroom door and her little girl is facing away from her with earbuds in and she says, honey, what are you listening to? And the little girl turns around and she's black. And the mother goes, oh, no! you know? And then, one of the two black women on Saturday Night Live, the, the tall one, says, uh, what are you doing? That's my daughter. You know, we're over, she's here for a play date. And your daughter's over there. She's still white. You know? And then, to me, the most telling comment, or most truthful comment in the skit, is uh, two white guys are... Uh, cowering under a desk when they realize that not only Beyonce but other female celebrities who've become popular with white people like Kerry Washington, the star of ABC's very popular scandal, are also black. And one man says, how can they be black? They're women. And the other shrieks, I think they might be both. <laughs> that's, that's what is so terrifying. Uh, to these white men. Her performance is extra scary because it implicitly combines sexuality and politics wrapped in a body that's at once black and female. A basic premise of feminist thought is that our place in society shapes our standpoint and our politics. Since the slavery era, black women like Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman, have been at the forefront of developing this insight in an analysis of the particular place of black women at the intersection of multiple inequalities of power. In recent decades, black feminists, most prominently Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins, have theorized this political tradition and called it intersectionality. The opening paragraph of their pioneering 1977 statement the Combahee River Collective statement explains, we are a collective of black feminists who have been meeting together since 1974. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see our particular task, the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. A classic statement of intersectionality from 1977. I want to home in on one sentence in their statement that pinpoints why black women's particular position in these interlocking systems of oppression makes their sexuality so dangerous. Quote, Black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stance to white male rule, and have actively resisted its inroads upon them and their communities in both dramatic and subtle ways. So they're saying that black women embody a political position, and it's a political position that's adversarial to white male rule. So in this lecture, I want to explore how black women's sexuality poses a threat to white patriarchal 
capitalist regimes, the one that founded this nation and has yet to be eliminated. Policing and punishing black women's sexuality has been crucial to maintaining these regimes and has impeded sexual liberation more broadly. In my lecture next week, I'll discuss the second part of the Combahee River Collective's sentence that I highlighted, how black women have resisted intervention in their sexuality and why sexual liberation should start with them. Though it's often left out of analyses of US biopolitics, regulating black women's bodies has been absolutely crucial to the relationship between race and gender and biology and power from America's origins to the present day, spanning the slavery, Jim Crow, and neoliberal eras. Under the system of chattel slavery, black women's bodies served a critical biopolitical function. Black women were commercially valuable to their masters, not only for their labor, but also for their ability to produce more enslaved property for them. Black women were defined as property who not only worked for their masters, but gave birth to more property. Whites then could maintain their domination and increase their wealth by devising a legal and political apparatus that gave them control over black women's sexuality and childbearing. An oppressive apparatus centered on black women's bodies, and it was and is still the linchpin of the system of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. In fact, regulating black women's sexuality was so important, the white settler colonists radically altered English law, the law of inheritance and kinship, that, like, one of the most important aspects of British society, right, in law, to support it. One of the colony's very first laws, a Virginia statute enacted in 1662, gave children born to enslaved black women and fathered by white men the status of slaves. I mean, who would think that you would have a law that would deny to men the right of passing along their status and their property to their children. That, that's how it had always been under British law. The father is the one that determined the rights, the inheritance, the status of children. But the very first law in the United States opposed that changed it, flipped it completely so that the status of black women's children was their status, not their white father's status if they, the children had been fathered by white men. The sexual violation of enslaved women and girls set a long lasting foundation for contemporary notions about black female sexuality. One of the most horrific aspects of slavery's ownership of black bodies was enslaved women's experience of sexual violence by their masters. The institution of slavery created for slaveholders, oh, actually for any man, the possibility of unrestrained sexual access and control. This encompassed both slave masters sexual aggression at will against their female the, their, the enslaved women that they owned, and their requirement that enslaved girls have early sexual experiences with them and with enslaved men. So girls weren't protected either. They had no right, no sense that uh, they deserved or were entitled to be protected from sexual violation. Not only did white men have the legal right to treat their property as they wished, but enslaved women and girls had no legal interest recognized at all in their own bodily integrity. The law didn't recognize the rape of black women or girls by any man. 
When a slave named George was charged with having sex with a child under the age of 10, a Mississippi court dismissed the indictment. The laws that regulated sex among whites were simply not relative, relevant to enslaved people. The judge said, their intercourse is promiscuous and it's le it is left to be regulated by their owners. Enslaved women who fought back were brutally punished. In June, on June 23, 1855, a 19 year old enslaved woman in Missouri named Celia resisted being repeatedly raped by her owner, Robert Newsom, and clubbed him to death when he backed her into a corner. A judge rejected her claims of self defense, and she was convicted of first degree murder and hanged on December 21st, 1855. Lena Baker, a black woman who worked as a maid to support her family, was charged with capital murder and executed in 1945 for killing her white boss, Ernest Knight, with his own gun in self-defense after he imprisoned her and sexually assaulted her. Now here again we see a radical break from tradition because in Georgia no woman had ever been executed but they electrocuted her to death, and she was the only woman executed by electrocution in the state of Georgia. The trial in December, just last December, of Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holtzclaw, who's charged with sexually assaulting 13 black women, cracked open a door into racialized sexual victimization by law enforcement. Holtzclaw targeted black women who he arrested and then coerced them into having sex with him because he thought no one would listen or care about them. When an all-white jury believed some of the brave survivors who testified against him, Holtzclaw broke down in what I think was just utter disbelief that he could be convicted of a crime for having sex with these women. In the end, and forcing them to have sex with him, to be specific, in the end, he was convicted of only 18 of 36 counts, though that was enough for the judge to sentence him to 263 years in prison. But we're left to question how many other thousands and thousands of assaults of vulnerable black women and girls go unreported or unheard of, unlistened to. This legacy of sexual and reproductive violence has been preserved over the centuries by a repertoire of degrading images designed to legitimize white men's immorality. Images that paint black women as innately prone to having unrestrained sex, procreating recklessly, and then passing down a depraved lifestyle to their children. Two of the most prominent images of enslaved women are erotic opposites the oversexed Jezebel, and the asexual Mammy. The biblical figure of Jezebel, a woman governed by her sexual desires, made white men's sexual abuse of black women seem justified. If black women were innately promiscuous, they couldn't be violated. Jezebel also defined black women in contradiction to the prevailing image of the true woman who was virtuous, pure, and white. Also in contrast to Jezebel, the happily subservient Mammy was created to justify the exploitation of black women's domestic labor and to symbolize the ideal black female who was obedient to white men. Unlike the tempting Jezebel, Mammy was depicted to accentuate her domesticity and lack of sex, sex appeal for white men. That's why she was safe. She was obedient and asexual. She represented the utmost safety in womanhood because she was both asexual and enslaved. You know, I'm skipping ahead, but just think about what that means for sexual liberation how powerful it is to have an image like this that is still circulated in our society of what an obedient woman is. 
Her total de sex devotion to her master's children restrained all the dangers of black female sexuality let loose in Jezebel. The dominant white culture framed black women's sexuality according to this pole of opposites, or op poles of opposites, this dichotomy. The natural black woman who is sexually licentious on the one hand, and the respectable black woman whose sexuality is erased on the other. According to this framing, black female sexuality is defined as inherently and essentially immoral. The black female body represents promiscuity. When 11-year-old Danielle Hicks Best reported being raped in her Washington, D.C. neighborhood, just about, maybe it was about five years ago, it's a very recent case, she was charged with filing a false report, this is an 11-year-old girl, charged with filing a false report, made to plead guilty, the, the lawyers convinced her parents to plead guilty on her behalf, so she was convicted and made a ward of the court despite medical evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. Now how could this happen, any of this happen to an 11-year-old girl? This is what the police lieutenant wrote about her in her files of 2009. Danielle was convicted of lying. All sex was consensual. So there was no doubt that she had sex with these men in her neighborhood who picked her up in their car and took her to their apartment. No doubt. She's 11 years old. Parents are unable to accept the fact that this child's promiscuous behavior caused this situation. You know, the legacy of slavery continues in statements like this that, again, how many little girls are in foster care because of situations like this? When pops, and, and notice also how her parents are blamed. Her parents were fighting for her. They're blamed for not accepting the nature of a little black girl. When pop singer Britney Spears was at the height of her celebrity, now this is some years ago, <laughs> which you all, some of you in the room will remember Britney Spears when she was really popular. And uh, an NPR program discussed teenage girls' imitation of, of her sexually suggestive look. Now, think, as I'm telling you about this NPR program, think about that Saturday Night Live skit about Beyonce. Okay. Commentators discussed how did Britney avoid appearing too sexually deviant to be an appropriate role model for American teenagers. Harold Coda, curator of the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art explained that Spears was able to maintain respectability while flirting with a provocative style, quote, because she is so all-American that to transpose, for example, a bare midriff or a piercing on that kind of wholesome canvas, remember Rudolph Giuliani, Rudy, right? She's not wholesome, referring to Beyonce. We want wholesomeness, okay, but Britney Spears was wholesome. I, I should have, you know, I did have a, a slide of her, but I decided not to put her up. But if you compare Britney Spears' outfit that they were talking about and what Beyonce was wearing, Beyonce was modest. I mean, it came up to here, right? Okay. Um, okay, but Britney Spears, that kind of wholesome canvas suddenly makes it acceptable for a broader spectrum of individuals. Okay, whose body is a wholesome canvas? Britney Spears' whiteness gave her the flexibility to experiment with sexiness while remaining socially acceptable. A black woman's body, by contrast, you know, Beyonce, after white America, discovered she was black, you know, she accentuates her blackness. It can't serve as a wholesome canvas on which to benignly transpose sexual symbols. 
The mainstream media accord black women very little leeway to, quote, float, flirt, sorry, with more dangerous and marginal aspects of sexuality without falling off the precipice of deviance. This portrayal of dangerous female black sexuality reinforced a corollary belief that black women's procreation is also dangerous and in need of white management. Mammy could serve as a surrogate mother to children who were not born of her own sexual activity. Now they were, who cared about them, right? Nobody cared, nobody in power cared about them. And in fact, black women, enslaved women, were routinely accused of being neglectful mothers. And there was a whole myth about how they would smother their babies because they were so neglectful and uncaring and they would roll over and smother their babies. This was the excuse in the 1800s for uh, sudden infant death syndrome among black infants. And Mammy could only have this role as long as she remained under the moral supervision of her white mistress. Jezebel, by contrast, was painted as a bad mother because her sexuality was inherently depraved. This opposition of black female sexuality and moral motherhood was perpetuated in the 1960s stereotype of the black matriarch whose sexual aggression emasculated black men, creating the, black, the female headed household that Daniel Patrick Moynihan and others blamed for the demise of the black family. And in the 1980s, it was the welfare queen, the black woman who had reckless sex. Not, not only, un, it was even more devious. It wasn't just that she was recklessly having sex. She deliberately did it to have babies so that she could collect a welfare check. That was, and then, because of course she was a depraved black mother, she didn't care about her children. She spent all the money on herself. And so uh, the American public was told that welfare was being wasted on black women who were deliberately cheating taxpayers out of their hard-earned money to support their, the black women's country club lifestyle. In the 1990s, the pregnant crack addict was added to the imagery of depraved black sexual, sexuality and maternity. Again, this link between reckless sex and dangerous motherhood. Black women were falsely accused by the media of routinely trading sex for crack. Do you remember those stories in the media? Uh, which not only did it have negative consequences on the fetus, according to studies that have been discredited now, and media reports totally discredited, but it, crack was supposed to chemically deprive black women, and for some reason only black women, of maternal instinct. <laughs> it's literally reported that it deprived black women of maternal instinct, and therefore they were unfit to take care of their children. Then they were supposed to give birth to the so-called crack baby who was said, again, to have this unique outcome from exposure to drugs. No other babies in history had it. Only black babies exposed to crack were supposed to lack social con a social conscience. And therefore, we're going to become criminals and welfare dependents. Uh, and a threat to U.S. society. Over the last several years, an anti-abortion billboard campaign in cities like Chicago, Atlanta, and New York literally reiterated the message that black women's wombs are dangerous. I don't know if you can read that, but uh, this, this was up on the side of a building in Soho, um, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. So whether resulting in babies or abortions, black women's sexuality is portrayed as a threat to these women's children, communities, 
and importantly, to society as a whole. Politicians, policymakers, sociologists, demographers, public health experts, epidemiologists, the media, I could go on and on, all cast black women's sexuality as an urgent social problem. They routinely circulate these icons of black female sexual irresponsibility to support birth control, welfare reform, foster care, and law enforcement policies that punish black women's sexual and childbearing decisions. Thousands upon thousands of black women across the country were sterilized without their consent in the 1960s and 1970s. And it has not ended. Uh, in 2013, an investigative uh, story by Corey Johnson based on excellent work by an organization called Justice Now that advocates for incarcerated women revealed that the state of California had been sterilizing without consent, without informed consent, adequate consent. I mean, there were ways they coerced women to sign papers, but incarcerated women in multiple different ways, sometimes just tricking them, telling them they, had, they were there for a hernia and removing their uterus. And uh, for all these women, they did not get the approval required by California state law. And the head of this operation, Dr. James Heinrich, told the reporter that he had saved California money compared to what you, you save in welfare, paying for these unwanted children as they procreated more. I mean, I, if he said that to a reporter, I want to know what did he say behind closed doors about these women. So this ideology, which I call a eugenicist ideology, that sterilizing poor black women is the answer to not only black poverty, but poverty in America, that it saves taxpayer money, that it's good social policy, that is still circulating and having real consequences for women. Again, I will say, it was exposed in California. What other state prisons are doing this? I doubt it's just California. We just don't know about it yet. It's hidden. After Congress and Bill Clinton abolished the federal entitlement to welfare, fueled by the mythical welfare queen, most states pass laws that deny any additional benefit to women who become pregnant while already receiving public assistance. Now, some states give women an out if they sign a form saying they have been sterilized, they can get the benefits. I'm not kidding, that's in California. If to sign that you have been sterilized or are using a very dangerous set of long-acting implanted contraceptives, and then you, you might get your benefits. And this, what, these laws were passed explicitly to deter women on welfare from having children and backed up by the image of the black welfare queen. In response to the pregnant crack addict and crack baby myths, prosecutors across the country charged hundreds and hundreds of women with fetal crimes and took newborns from thousands and thousands more women. Black women are overrepresented in the punitive welfare prison and foster care systems. And they, these systems are all propped up by ideologies and images that portray them as hypersexual and hyperfertile. Now, although black women bear the brunt of these dehumanizing policies, the impact reverberates far beyond them. Casting black women as a sexual threat blames their bodies for the consequences of social, political, and economic inequities. It garners support for dismantling the welfare state, forcing struggling families to rely on poverty wages, 
and locking them up if they can't survive. And it's so powerful that even white people who are hurt by these policies, who are also struggling to survive on poverty wages, will support someone like Donald Trump because they don't want to seem associated with these women. That's how powerful it is. It gets people to vote against their very survival. What, what works so well? What works like that? I can't think of anything else that works so well as making black women's sexuality seem a threat to US society. But a black woman's sexuality actually is a threat <laughs> to white male rule. It is. I, so it's made to look like it, but the thing is it actually is. <laughs> because black women have no, you know, I was thinking about this. Like this, this part I wrote last night because I'm thinking about it. I don't want to say it just is made to look like a threat. It, really, it is a threat. But then I said, why? Why is it so threatening? Okay, this is what I came up with. You can tell me what you think. <laughs> because black women have no vested interest in paying sexual allegiance to the regime of white male rule. Black women aren't in a political position to be tamed by white heterosexist marriage. And they are not in a position to be obsessed with white biological purity. Like black women's children are not white. They cannot be white. They will never be white. But it's very rare that black women are allowed to enter into white heterosexual marriage. Probably the, I, I, I would bet you, I haven't looked at the latest statistics, but I bet you the least, the lowest number of interracial marriages are black women to white men, I bet. And controlling dangerous black female sexuality operates not only to restrain black women's bodies, but also to maintain institutions and ideologies that impede sexual liberation more broadly. Okay, now, how, what, how, does all of this punishment and regulation and monitoring of black women's sexuality hinder sexual freedom more broadly in the United States? We'll focus on the United States. Well, first let's look at the link between black women's supposed licentious, innate licentious sexuality and their dangerous childbearing. There is this constant association between black women's sexuality, black women having sex, and their having too many babies. And that reinforces the ideology of compulsory motherhood, that the purpose of sex for women is to bear children. One of the main ways that women's sexuality is patrolled is to penalize women who want to have sex apart from being a mother. Now you might say, that doesn't happen in the United States today. Oh, it doesn't? Have you looked at abortion law in the United States? Have you looked at how virtually every state in this country is passing laws that try to keep women from terminating a pregnancy, compelling them to be mothers, to bear children against their will? This patriarchal link between women's sexuality and procreation is fundamental to misogynistic abortion laws that devalue women's health below that of a fetus, making disfigurement of women. I mean, women there are cases now where women are using coat hangers again to terminate their pregnancies because they are in states where they can't get access to abortion services. Even the death of women is punishment for getting pregnant without the desire to be a mother. 
the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in um, the Carhartt case, Carhartt versus Gonzalez, the partial birth, the latest part, the latest U.S. Supreme Court decision on abortion, the partial birth abortion, upholding the federal partial birth, so-called partial birth abortion law, is outrageous in how Kennedy's opinion completely dismisses the health of women. He completely doesn't care about doctors' testimony that some procedures are required to protect the health of women. That is just ignored, downplayed in favor of the more important interest of the fetus. It's astounding to me, astounding to me, that the US Supreme Court has devalued women's lives so much. And states around this country are devaluing women's lives because of this connection between sex and motherhood, or partly because of it. That's an important aspect of it. This link is also a chief argument against queer sex and was routinely presented and is still presented in legal briefs challenging the constitutional right to equal marriage, same-sex marriage. Again, astounding that in this day and age, you would have legal briefs filed in court that say, well, gays and lesbians can't get married because they can't have children. And uh, therefore, their sex is deviant because it's not designed for childbearing. Black women have come to represent sex outside of marriage and stereotypes that stigmatize unwed black mothers and welfare policies that humiliate and punish them for raising children on their own are meant as a warning to white women. I'll never forget Charles Murray's Wall Street Journal article op-ed piece, the, the uh, coming threat to white America. Uh, where he says, you know, white people are starting to act like black people. They're having babies out of wedlock. You know, it's going to be a disaster. And again, this is what the, uh, the Saturday Night, Night Live skit was implying that, you know, the fear that white people are going to start acting like black people. The punishment of unwed black mothers is held up as a threat. You know, you better behave white women, or you're going to be punished too. And in fact, that is happening all over the country, uh, including with the punishment of white women who do something that's considered a risk to the fetus. I mean, white women are being, pregnant women are being punished much more now than they were back when it was mostly black women who use crack during pregnancy. But once these policies are in place, their effect spreads beyond black women to control and penalize other women as well. Finally, oh, and I also want to mention that these policies also reinforce the neoliberal reliance on marriage as the only legitimate option for mothers to find support for their caregiving. And again, welfare restructuring, the 1996 Welfare restructuring law explicitly, have you ever read the preamble? It's all about mar marriage is the answer to poverty in America. Unwed mothers should be getting married to take care of their children, not relying on public assistance. That's in the preamble. That was the, the, what fueled, a in addition to not wanting these women, if they're not gonna get married, they shouldn't be having children and coercing them into uh, using birth control or becoming or being sterilized. Finally, the concept that black women are not rapeable reinforces a rape culture in which categories of disobedient women, including sex workers, trans women, and even white female college students who you think would be totally protected, but even they, if they have too much to drink at frat parties, are not entitled, according to some people, to legal protection from sexual violence, and the perpetrators, especially affluent white men, are protected from legal accountability. Now, I know this is very controversial on university campuses, at least it is in 
my, at the law school, at our faculty, but the extent of sexual assaults at colleges and universities, okay, disputed how much there is. But it's indisputable that there's a widespread campus culture that accepts forcible sex under certain circumstances and that at least part of the pushback against administrative efforts to address this is to protect white college boys who might get in trouble for it. Black women survivors of all sorts of sexual assaults are barely mentioned in these debates. I, I, I don't know if it's just me, I never see black women in the images about the, the debate uh, uh, on um, sexual assault on campus. Or most debates about changing sexist customs on campus or elsewhere, but the long history of permitting their sexual violation is a critical part of the unspoken context. So what's so dangerous about black women's sexuality? To go back to the Combahee River Collective statement I quoted earlier, and let me repeat it, black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stance to white male role. The long legacy of controlling that threat through a repressive apparatus of interlocking stereotypes, ideologies, policies and institutions has denied black women sexual freedom and repressed sexual freedom more broadly. Okay, look at that for a minute. That. Uh, but there's another side to the threat posed by black women's sexuality. The second half of the Combahee River Collective sentence says, quote, and black women have actively resisted these inroads upon them and their communities in both dramatic and subtle ways. In my companion lecture next Wednesday, I'll argue that liberating sexuality must start with black women. Thank you. Hi, um, my Hi. name is Joelle, and I was in your Africana class over the summer. Yeah. With and Hi, Joelle. It's Hi. good to see you. You're supposed to come by and see me. What happened? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were on sabbatical. I am, but okay. see, some students don't care about that. They come by anyway. But anyway, go on, sweetie. Um, my question is, I was really interested in your research that we talked about in class, and I was wondering if you saw any intersections between um, your previous research about race, science, and society and this topic. Yes, yes. So Joelle was in the Summer Institute, which is a wonderful program that the Africana Studies Center has uh, over the summer for incoming freshmen at Penn. And I taught a course called Race, Science, and Society. And that was about the way in which science has been influenced by biological concepts of race and in turn has promoted biological concepts of race and the consequences for society, especially for racial injustice in, society, in our society. Uh, and yeah, I absolutely see a connection between what I talked about today and that um, promotion of biological concepts of race. Black, controlling black women's sexuality was essential to promoting a biological concept of race because uh, the white settlers in the United States wanted to establish a system of slavery that was justified by a science of innate racial difference. So they invented, well, European typologists before them, but they went with it, uh, <laughs> creating an entire legal structure around a myth that human beings are naturally divided into biological races and white people are naturally superior, more beautiful, more intelligent, entitled to dominate, and black people were at the bottom, closer to animals, uh, 
reckless, irrational, and a critical component of these opposite traits was that black people could not control their sexuality. That was true for black men and women. That, that's the, and it, a very important aspect of the biological myth of race. And so that, that, that um, the idea that black people, but especially black women, can't control their sexuality, that they're high and they are hyper fertile, that they're biologically in need of white supervision is critical to the whole concept of biological race, but also to the way in which it was justified. You know, it, it, that myth of biological race requires an apparatus that defines what races are. Who belongs to what race? How do you tell the difference? What are the qualities of people of different races? What are the entitlements and privileges and disentitlements of people of different races? All of that is part of the political system of race. And everything I talked about in my lecture tonight is part of that political system of race. The other thing is, I'll just mention one more thing and, and go move on, um, is fundamentally what the, the, the myth of biological race does is explain racism and white supremacy and the inequities that flow from them as the result of biological difference. And similarly, what I talked about tonight is one component of that, the myth that the reason for social inequities in the United States, especially those that disadvantage black people, but more broadly than that as well, that those result from black women's sex, sexual activity and, fertil and hyperfertility. Again, it's a biological explanation of social inequality. So there's an, a common ideology underlying the biological concept of race that also underlies the, the ideology that controls, you know, that there's a need to control black women's sexuality and fertility. Does that make sense? <laughs> and be in touch with me. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a Penn alum. Um, so Hi, Sarah. Hi. You were also yes, in my I class. To talk to you, yes. Um, Sarah so, was in my sociology yeah. class on race, size, and sight. Yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, so, in commenting on Beyonce's Super Bowl performance, yeah. in contrast to Kendrick Lamar's yes. Grammy performance, yes. I want to know your opinions on that difference, as yeah. well as what you would recommend for black men um, in advocacy for, uh, like, say your, her name and black right. female um, liberation in terms yes. of sexuality. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I kind of gave black men a pass on this lecture. <laughs> I can't do everything. I can't do it all in one lecture, man. I, you know, it's like hip hop, rap lyrics. I just, I couldn't get to, you know, Nellie and uh, R. Kelly, I just, you know, and others, I couldn't get to. So anyway, that, that ages me right there. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring that up in my next lecture. But uh, so, you know, Kendrick Lamar was, uh, uh, gave a performance at the Grammys that was, some of the lyrics sounded, they was almost like literally the same as Beyonce's lyrics in formation. Uh, and also very militant, uh, and as again, as far as I could tell, praise, uh, uniform praise. I mean, certainly he hasn't gotten this morning or yesterday morning. You know, I didn't hear Rudy Giuliani coming out against him, or New York State senators, or protest rallies called for. So there is a quite a contrast between 
the reaction that Beyonce got and Kendrick Lamar got. Now, it, it um, you know, I asked my daughter about it, and uh, she, she thought that uh, maybe it was the forum that, you know, the Grammys are a little edgier than the Super Bowl. But I think, as I was suggesting in my opening, that it has to do with the fact that Beyonce is seen as a sex symbol. She talks about her sexuality. And so her performance combined sexuality and politics, which then highlights that she's a black woman. And now it becomes dangerous in a way that is not dangerous for black men to do, at least not in the way that Lamar did it. He did not, he didn't bring sex into it. Uh, to me, it's the, the, the threatening nature of Beyonce's sexuality com uh, combined with a political message that accentuates that she is a black woman. And now the threat is more apparent. So that's, you know, I haven't had time to go into a deep analysis of it, but that's my initial reaction of, uh, on it. I, I see... Uh, we have some music experts raising their hands. <laughs> but, but just let me also say that, um, you know, I, again, I did not have a chance to go into the relationship between black men and black women and, um, and ways in which black men have both repressed black women's sexual freedom, but also can um, be part of sexual liberation. And, and also ways they would benefit, the ways they are harmed by the ideologies I talked about, and ways they would be liberated by opposing those ideologies. I mean, I firmly believe that any kind of black and sexual liberation has to involve uh, intersecting movements, including those that are focused on Black Lives Matter, um, which should include black women, does include, I mean, black women are at the forefront, but should include them even more than the media at least has portrayed it. Um, and uh, black men, have to oppose the insinuation, sometimes the explicit statement, that black women should take a back seat uh, until we have black liberation. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's like from the 60s, but you hear it now, even now you hear it. Even now you hear it. When I tweet about black women, I get replies from some black men, why are you dividing us? What? I tweet about black men all the time. Why did you don't say I'm dividing you then? It's like, what? if I raise concerns about black women's safety and rights and humanity, that's dividing the black community. So that, um, you know, black men have to come on board. Not that, that, that is divisive to think that way. Hi, my name is Sierra. Um, I don't go here, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you weren't one of my students. <laughs> um, but my question is this. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like today we talked about, you know, black women and their sexuality. And a lot of times I think about today and obviously back then about the fetish, I'm going to call it fetishization or, you know, just people having a fetish for black women's sexuality. Yes. But there's, but I feel like black men are fetishized too, you know, with the whole they have bigger penises and all these other mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But I was, but but I wanted to know if you ever thought about because I again I don't go here, I don't go to your classes. Yeah. But I wanted to wanted to know if you ever thought about in what ways have those stereotypes benefited them? If you feel like they've benefited them <laughs> in any way, how over sexualizing one particular gender works I, works in some way and in what ways that they don't, because I've never actually heard about that. So I was wondering if you thought about that in a comparison contrast and why you might think that might be. 
Yeah, I I don't think that stereotypes benefit people, and the the um, especially when they were created to justify treating people as if they weren't human. So um, I think that what these stereotypes about black men and women's sexuality do is limit our freedom to explore and create and present and experience our sexuality for ourselves. And I'm not saying we don't do that, but it's, there are ways in which it's limited. And so I, 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 I find it hard to think of it as benefiting us. I think we, I think we really have to work at ending, opposing, contesting those stereotypes that come out of slavery and dehumanization and imagine a liberated sexuality outside of them while working. I mean, I'm giving away some of the weeks, but while, while working, I'm not just talking about visions in our head, though. I think vision is important. I think imagination is really important, but you have to work to undo the structural impediments. I mean, we're talking about real structural impediments to people's sexual freedom. You know, when you get locked up in jail for your sexuality, when you are unable to access health care because of your sexuality, you know, these are real material constraints on your ability to be sexually free. So I think that concrete contestation and subversion of the ideologies that support them, but also those structures is critical to sexual freedom. And the, and the stereotypes as well. Thank you, Dorothy, Hi, for a, a wonderful talk and Thank very you. stimulating. I came out, when I saw the title, I came out because I am thinking, as a musicologist, I yes. am thinking a lot about Beyonce, yeah. Beyonce course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, see? And if, if you don't mind, if we could circle back sure. to the question about uh, how Kendrick Lamar's All Right and Beyonce's yeah. uh, uh, formation have been uh, kind of uh, interpreted and reacted to in different ways. Yeah. But first of all, we're talking about four different texts in play, not two. There is the whole version of the video, both right. their released videos, and then there is the performed one yes. live. Yes. So talking about four different things. Right. It was kind of amazing to me that uh, people were responding to the, the Super Bowl one with such, you know, uh, you know force. Mm -hmm. When actually the other video is where all of the political, you know, mm -hmm. stuff, you know came in. Mm -hmm. The halftime show for me was like Zigville for Follies mm -hmm. compared to the previous one. <laughs> now, I think that uh, as you're... As your talk taught us, yeah. it's about uh, when when Beyonce gets critiqued. It's about people being out of place. So, yes. uh, I, so I, I want to push back a little bit yeah. on the idea that Kendrick Lamar is desexualized or unsexual. In that, all right, it's just that as a male rapper performing a protest rap. He is always already sexualized. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is uh, it is the template in mm -hmm. which he is in his place. Mm -hmm. So when Beyonce comes, you know, when she she's the thing about it. First of all, she has a larger body of work, so she's been out here, you know, more years, mm -hmm. and so that people are reacting to, as the SNL send up mm -hmm. suggests, they're su they are reacting to her body of work. And this latest iteration, which, yeah. if, and if we expand our our kind of analysis to include the idea that this is music, <clears throat> I read so many pieces. Nobody talks about the fact that these are not just 
sexual things or protest things, but mm -hmm. they're also both those songs are embedded in musical discourse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I just left a class where I analyzed mm -hmm. all right and formation mm -hmm. against one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really amazing <laughs> how avant-garde the uh, Beyonce piece is in terms of the trap mu music underlay and then the idea that the emotional focal point of the piece is not sung as many of her pieces have been before, mm -hmm. but wrapped, again, she's out of yeah. place, out of generic place. Yes. I could go on and on and yeah. on, but, yeah. I, but I won't. <laughs> and I'll just leave it there yeah. and say that uh, your, your talk really gave me an excellent framing for understanding the material and historical grounding mm -hmm. of only one aspect of this sexual nature yes. of Beyonce. But yes. the musical one, we, we're we just really beginning to come to terms with. Yes, and please don't ask me to comment on that aspect because I am not an expert whatsoever on it. But yeah, and I, of course, was mostly commenting on the reaction to it, not on my own analysis of it, which you are far more expert to do than I am. But thanks for that in, that insight. I, I like that idea, and I think that's absolutely right, of what is expected, what's their place, what's their usual, um, how they're usually seen. And again, with Beyonce, the politics is what made her now so visibly black in ways that maybe people hadn't, weren't as conscious of before. You know, they knew she was black, but it was, it was up front now in ways it hadn't been in her prior performances. Hello, I'm Zara. I came in excruciatingly late coming from work. That's okay. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to, I guess it's uh, kind of a comment mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the, um, talking about the stereotypes of sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, rather than just speaking on it possibly being beneficial. I just want to talk kind of about the detrimental yeah. aspect of it as yeah. far as black women. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of black women being over-sexualized or you know, their, their sexual appearance, not in just um, repressing sexuality, but putting this type of sexuality on black women where you think about the 13 women in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and I heard a lot about um, you know, well, well, what were they wearing or what were they doing? Or, you know, this black woman being sexualized and wanting to, wanting to have sex or whatever. It's just this bigger thing on top of black women that um, I, I work with survivors that they experience mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. far as, you know, well, what were you doing yeah. to cause this to happen? Yeah. And I just want to throw a plug in. Yeah. Plug in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing an event specifically for black women. It's an open mic art show, March. So if anybody is interested in coming, I have you. <laughs> and just so you know, I did mention in my talk the, the Daniel Holtzclaw's trial and the women he sexually assaulted. Yeah, I, I did talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, my name's Hi. Kim. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. That was outstanding. Sure. I was wondering if we could bring the conversation back to the question of regulating black women's babies. Yeah. And was wondering if you could uh, kind of retrace the steps a little bit, mm -hmm. how you said that um, during times of slavery, mm -hmm. that women were valued for their ability to create property. <laughs> You know, I mean, in this, in this, you know, valued monetarily, maybe I wouldn't say they were valued in the sense that their humanity was accorded any respect or um, dignity or care. But go on. Um, it, but yeah, just the way that word, what that word means in your question. But go on. Sure. Yeah. Um, and yet now there's, uh, you know, forced sterilizations. Yeah. Yeah. And so how did black babies, I guess, um, the, the perception of black babies change over time from this, yeah, uh, I guess, you know, their, their role during times of slavery to, uh, to present day, mm -hmm. um, this kind of tension between um, being valued as a fetus more than the women's bodies, but then also uh, 
being prevented in terms of sterilizations. If that yeah, well, b enslaved women's childbearing was valuable in the sense that it was commercially profitable to slaveholders because it produced pr their property. I mean, their babies and themselves were treated as pro chattel property that was owned uh, and bought and sold and forced to work. So um, that, you know, it's interesting when you say, how did it change? I think that treatment of black children as property who could be violated, as I mentioned, black little girls could be sexually violated without any protection. Um, and children were made to work. So that, that concept of childhood as not being innocent, not being free, not being um, moral, you know, not deserving protection because of the value of the child himself or herself, I think also has a long lasting legacy to today where there's, there's so many ways in which black children are devalued by society, by state, the state, by police officers, by uh, the education system, the healthcare system, the foster care system. I could, there, you know, I'm, I'm, there's so much to that that I could give so many examples. We only have to look at the killings of young black ch children. I mean, Tamir Rice, um, the, oh, I'm, her name is escaping, the little girl who was lying on the couch and was, yes, shot to death. Um, by a police officer. Uh, we could go, the, the video that was circulating of the high school girl who was taken up and smashed to the ground by a, a guard in the, or police officer. I mean, there are just so many that uh, we see virtually daily now. And also we know from uh, studies, social psychology studies, that black children are seen as older than white children when they're the same age. They're seen as less innocent. They're seen as more prone to crime. They're seen as more deserving of adult punishment. Um, so to me, the, the way that US society treats black children is, a, is part of a long legacy that began during slavery, I I don't think the, even the the way in which slaveholders protected the fetus because it was going to it was already their property. Um, you know, I when I um, in my book Killing the Black Body, I talk about the way the pregnant enslaved women were beaten for punishment. The the slaveholders would dig a hole in the ground and they were forced to lie on the ground and then beaten on their backs. So to protect you know, this property that was the fetus. Well, that is not valuing or you know, treating anybody either like a human being. It's dehumanizing both the mother and the fetus. And I use that as a sort of metaphor for the way in which black women in the late 80s and early 1990s were being arrested for fetal crimes uh, as if there was some concern for the fetus when in fact uh, these children were then labeled crack babies and treated in horrific ways as well. Not to mention, I mean, I could go on, this is a subject of another lecture, to talk about the foster care system in the United States, which I mentioned as one of these institutions that is tightly related to the welfare system and the prison system, that is disproportionately, uh, its population is disproportionately 
black children who are forcibly removed from black mothers. Uh, and part of the reason for that is a devaluation of the bond between black mothers and their children. That also is supported by empirical evidence, but I have seen it in my work in the child welfare system, the way that people working that, some people working that system talk about how it's better for black children to be removed from their mothers and placed in foster care with, in some cases, absolutely no inkling whatsoever that there is an important loving caring bond between the mother and the child that is going to be harmed by tearing them apart. The way in which black women who make up a disproportionate percent of the prison population now are shackled during childbearing, their babies taken from them, uh, they're handcuffed if they're even allowed to nurse their baby for a day, you know, before the baby's ripped away from them. I mean, I, there's horrific things, horrific things that go on in this country because of the devaluation of the relationship between black mothers and their children. And that, again, we can trace to the slavery era where children were routinely taken from their parents and sold off to other masters and the myth was circulated. They don't care about their children. Did, do you remember in 12 Years a Slave, did some of you, where the, the um, enslaved woman arrives at a plantation house and she's crying because they took her children from her. And the mistress says, why is she crying? What's wrong with her? Why is she bawling? You know, and, and they said, well, she just lost her children. We're just sold away. And she says, oh, never mind. She'll forget them you know, by tomorrow. You know, this idea that this is part of, you know, going back to Joelle's question about the biological concepts of race, part of the biological concept of race is that black people innately don't have the same feelings as other people, that we don't love as much, we don't care as much, we don't have as important bonds, we are not rom I mean, despite all the song, that all the romantic songs are by black people, but still, in real life, in real life, <laughs> I just heard the stylistics in, in Atlantic City for Valentine's Day. And uh, I mean, come on, they made so many great romantic songs. And yet, though, but, let, but when you get down to reality, the, the, the myth that black people don't feel pain still operates. I'll just mention one more thing. I know Jim is waiting there and saying it's 6.30, but uh, one more thing. You know, there are multiple studies that show that black um, patients with long bone fractures are far less likely to get any pain relief for them. Uh, and part of that, in, in, in a study just last fall that showed that black children, this goes to your question about black, black children suffering in pain from appendicitis. This is, they're not making this, they have appendicitis in emergency rooms are half as likely to get any opioid painkillers as white children. I mean, we're talking about children who are screaming in pain. How is it that doctors, this is documented, do not see their pain? There is a long-standing stereotype, again, that goes back to slavery, that black people don't feel pain the way other people feel it. And I'm not making this up. It is, you can see it, it you know, it's empirically proven. But we all know it. You can see it in everyday life. And that applies to the pain of losing your children as well. <laughs>